Well, hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rail's 68th Radical Poetry Reading. I'm Nick Bennett, the Special Projects Editor here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a poetry reading with Wendy Eisenberg, Lee Ronaldo, and Wendy Zhu, lovingly curated by Todd Colby. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions that we will post in just a moment. Um, but without further ado, it is my honor to pass the mic over to the curator of today's reading, Todd Colby. So Todd, over to you. Hi, thanks Nick. And, and thank you so much for inviting me to do this um, and to Fong for making this available in a platform for so many artists and, and, and writers and uh, other creatives. Um, this has just been a tremendous service to the community that we are all a part of. And, uh, and I feel very honored to be part of, of, of this today. Um, you know, when I got that call from you a week ago or so, um, um, my first thought was, um, why not pick some people that I've been really listening to and reading over the past several months? And by doing that, um, I came up with the names that we see here. Um, um, the one omission today is uh, Charmaine Lee, who is dealing uh, with an illness and we're sending her uh, good wishes for healing um, and, and really wish she could be here today, but I think she's tuning in today. And uh, I'm very sorry that she can't be here, but by all means, send her good vibes. Um, and so when it came to picking the people, I really was um, both the Wendy's, I've been either listening or reading or, or listening to Wendy Shoes reading at the Poetry Project on the YouTube site. Lee has been such an integral part of my life as an artist and a creative person um, that it just feels so good to, be, uh, to, to give it back and to invite people and to have people um, uh, read for me in my, in my, in my dining room. <laughs> um, and without further ado, I'll get started. So it was just, anyway, I welcome everyone. And um, this is gonna be fun. Um, the first reader is guitarist, banjo player and vocalist, Wendy Eisenberg. Uh, writes songs and improvises. They have released albums of improvised music on Zadok, VDSQ, Bada Bing, Feeding Tube, my local record store, Dear Life, and Garden Portal. Performed at Roulette, The Stone, and National Sawdust, and have released and toured several critically acclaimed albums of popular song, including with the rock brand, band trio Editrix. A writer on and around music, Wendy's writing can be found in John Zord's Arcana 8, Musicians on Music, The Sound American Edition 23, and in the Contemporary Music Review. Uh, their most recent recording, Bent Ring, uh, is available from Dear Life Records, and that's been heavily on my playlist. And there's one song in particular, I think you can stream it anywhere, called Amends, which just has gotten into my head, and I just play it again and again and again. Um, please welcome Wendy Eisenberg. Hello. Um, it's a pleasure to share this new stuff with you, and thanks for the kind words, Bent Ring is special to me too. So yes, I'll just read. Um, Once having just written long of lost things, I found the same. Me, unlost, but no reflection, just once. I had no suspicion that I was nonce, one to be lost. No course set there to lose, me. And so I retired that long thing, not once, but not me. Where did I not go? Am I ever to return me? No narrow wood, not yet so maybe wide, steel. No heart, once, but lost, me, in all my nonsense, a thousand rivals. I see my friends do it, and they like to drink more than I do. Does this mean that when I get around to doing it, I'll appear more virtuous or sound clearer or less? Their metrics of value here spin, green weight in orbit, threatening to, and if collapsing once in a biography. I said I do it, like by saying that I do it, I already did it. I am doing it. I'll do it skeuomorphic, in virtual reality, signaling I know I am, being, 
though on the flattering stage I sway, still, being familiar, being loath to describe myself. But of course I can't. I can't even learn to format on word, and when I write by hand, I marvels. But also I knows me, vain at the fact of sight, unscreen. I admire everyone, and me, the fact of my hand, scoring my unreal little glyphs, coy and spindly and soft lead. Why? Is this live? When I write and I can see it, I am struck by how senseless feel and look both glyph and echo. I hate to say, I sound. I can't lie in a song. The people I know who do it, do it with a wan, knowing air, like a tired flapper draped silkily on a velvet divan made of gimlet-sourced exhausting lives and electric liquor, and I covet them. How do they, in the questions they ask in their poems, appear so aware that they mightn't have to poem those questions because they already clearly know everything? They're unseasonable. Their context always shifts to just exclude them so they speak from behind a sexy veil, the veil of being tired in a way that smells mature. I, a rube, can only write when I am an overheated phone. Yeah, I do consider myself an envious person. Categorically, I envy. Envy, the careerist hollow of romantic longing, lovelorn yearning for the better. I bathe in it. Envy nourishes me. It makes me rest. I can't write when I'm wishing to be or have or even know what I want. I stay still. It's why I have so little left. Can't hang. Many times last year, I'd find myself bound, angry and mute, facing pronouncements and endlessness, completely unable to speak, which was unusual for me. I did not consider myself an envious person then, except life was the sight of me against me, resigned to the sad pleasure of wanting to be other, every other, lick boot, champagned and wax-backed, dominant, made sublimate, worm-like, not dancing, heavy, detailed, for all wanting. But now that I can talk again, I'll dish. Envy is a practice, the steps are few and easy to master. First, gaze at the moon, sending you to it through your eyes wordlessly. Then, ask it, a witch asking a mirror, if you are more than images or touch. Third, pose on endless sills, small fists under wishing chin, wide-angled and unfeeling, until the light casts you beatific in $34 highlighter, ringlet, and you stays all you need. Recently, I became obsessed with a blonde singer from California. She was no longer as popular as she was when I was in high school, when I didn't listen to her because she wasn't jazz. So I couldn't tell just anybody that I liked her because I did not know the lay of the cultural land. I like virtuosos. It's unfashionable, but I do. I like it when somebody funnels their understanding of an unyielding world into a form that existed before they could. So much the better to love it truly when their world could seemingly not adequately be contained by that form, so it had to expand, their world and that form, and neither be contained within the dull tracings of the attempting masses gnawing bird-like at the rotting corpse of ideas. I think this blonde singer from California is capable of that level of expansion, is a virtuoso, yet however briefly hovered beloved on the internet despite that ubiquitous for a half measure in some world of song, derided for sounding like a cartoon old maid child, though mostly she wrote even less fashionable stuff than what I do. But at least she was admired. I bet David Sylvian has a lovely kitchen. I bet Scott Walker wore immaculate perfume, something warm and dangerous, ink. I see Mark Hollis's ghost sketching a clarinet part onto crisp paper, his cloud-wide glowing, restful and cream. Loving someone and feeling like your love can rescue them from that they are inimitable or the stark beauty of their distance from you. Being loved, too, and feeling rescued from all about your life that isn't true or close to you. The distances closing in for good. Her song, 
with its weird long touch, shifted my right hand forever, made it strong between the differences of our strings, in translation, which is not just loss. I got faster to keep up with her, but my song stayed short. The future cracked light upon the world in a mock-up of the sun, and part of the earth reflected it in the unstoppable fire. I imagine the object of my poem practicing in the hall of Mary Astor's old place, never a renter. In my rental, I touch the scales another time. They toll. I saw Greenwood Cemetery from my plane, and I thought it was a lake. It was night. The night hushed velvet over the graves. In the emergency room, I said, I do not fear death, just the pain that will probably surround my death. And my friend who drove me there nodded, obligated, that sounds mature. A bite in the wall that once held a tube TV now holds nothing and faces us. A nearby flat screen is hung on a nearby wall turned off. The old wall yawns. Most maws gape and yawn, TVs flash. This maw, aghast and patient, wants. In triage, the nurse ends her shift by swaddling my thumb, lamenting crazy people outside needing her, with a laugh somehow. I did not look at my thumb until I changed the bandage a day and a half later, and I saw the stitches the doctor had installed for me in the gynecology room, isolated from the people breathing and from the man screaming at the nurses to suck his dick. When my plane flew over the brush strokes of real water, I considered the parks that were not lakes as being of a warmer texture, trimmed in gold, like the white robes of a Nereid, the night lamps lining the park, sewn up dark tight with no ooze, mother healing, beauty patterned and contained through multiple planes of round glass unreflective of the vast water of faces. I was afraid to look at the stitches. They made my thumb uneven. I was afraid of the pain I felt, so I did not feel it. My thumb stayed in shock for days, me and not me. Which made me think of Freud and then de Beauvoir and how funny it is that digital sex can mean hand stuff too. When I place my thumb in front of my eye and wink the other, I can blot out so much of the visual world, me and not me. And this is the last one. Sure, I could let the mystery in, as long as I'm assured that it will not change, not ever. I am afraid to drive or bike down hills, but I like to watch water fearlessly ejaculate over a rock formation towards an untimely death in communion white, the fall. As I grow, I sense the significance of all archetypes expand until everything means everything, and I too could be everything once. It's been less than a month here in the gauze, and every day dirt shores up dirtier in brown and surprisingly also in blue. Sure, I could say I perform rituals every other day, but they are not ceremonies. They are formalities. Money from an ATM, repeating swoops without grandeur, bounces off the hoop resulting lamely on the skirts. Which rituals? Shedding, spending, swearing, stretching, Scarring, scaring, stalling, starting. The pillar of salt road sign in Suffolk is real, quote, individual and probably unique. In 14th century Suffolk, they brushed paint mixed with ox blood over the exteriors of their buildings. Visiting angels warned the real pillar of salt not to look at the bloody life she probably wanted. Older, drier with salt, Silt gathered in the gauze, I look but do not want. Neither Suffolk County, where I could not breathe for singing. No desire either, nor do no doorstep mine to bloody. No despair, arise. The shearing, sneaking, stealing, seeing, streaking. I cannot string anything together under gauze, but I can rip. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Yay. Um, so the next reader is, uh, is Lee Ronaldo. Musician, visual artist, and writer Lee Ronaldo founded Sonic Youth in 1981 
and has been active on the New York and international music and art scenes for the past 40 plus years as composer, performer, and producer. He also exhibits visual art and has published several books of journals, poetry, and writings on music. His LP, Names of North End Women, was released in February 2020 on Mute Records, and his most recent recording, In Virus Times, came out uh, on Mute Records this past uh, November, um, and it has been the soundtrack in my art studio on a daily basis, and particularly the first cut off of that record, um, and there's a, a lonely whistling that he does in the midst of it that's just so beautiful and haunting, and then sirens in the background, and it's such a document of a time um, and a place, and I'm very grateful for, for that recording and for Lee being here today. Lee Ronaldo. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm really happy to be here today. Happy New Year. Hope everyone is uh, doing well and staying safe. Um, in keeping with uh, the spirit of this radical poetry uh, uh, afternoon, I'm going to read some poems that I wrote a few years ago that were, um, I wanted to give a little background on what these were. Uh, at the time, I was receiving all these strange uh, emails, spam emails you know, for, for stupid stuff like uh, whatever, penis enlargement or, you know, you know, those crazy emails, balding cures. And um, they were slipping through the spam filters because they were, they had masses of text in the emails. And so they looked like proper letters and the spam filters were fooled. But the text was all just random words as though a dictionary had exploded or in some cases, paragraphs taken from 18th century novels, it seemed like these really strange, uh, strange things that obviously came from somewhere. And I found them to be really strange and interesting. And, and I started looking at all these random words and I tried to read them, you know, as though they really were something. And I found that every once in a while there were two or three words strung together that just had the sense of, uh, of poetry, of a poetic image to me. And I started, uh, I started massing these huge documents full of these phrases. I was pulling phrases out of all these uh, emails that happened. They don't seem to happen so much anymore. Uh, maybe they've devised new and more devious ways to slip through the spam filters these days. But anyway, I started making these poems based on these strange random found phrases that I would sometimes just put next to each other and sometimes add some things of my own or change around or structure a little bit. And I called them uh, my internet spam poems. And I'm gonna read a short uh, selection of them today. Uh, this first one is called Hairstyle Assassination. It's how much you write, how you write them into or out of the picture how you react to responses. Two camps exist, one relating to symbols and the other, well, I don't have to spell it out. Brands are written in the neurons of people's minds. Many, ha, none, I've questions. With permission, here's your answer, and it's well worth reading. The incessant buzz of planes, Japan points east. The thick skin required to rip the throat out of an unknown enemy. I would love your thoughts and feedback on this. She comes over here and I can't be doing my work for looking at her. She was still full of Sunday calm. I smell lizard smell, she said, and I cried, masterpiece. In the morning, as night was drawing down, Renata was employed, R Renata was emptying the tea leaves. I came to the southern end of a line of coke. There's dangerous nostrils, the pungent aroma of wood smoke, bean curd cliffs lofty with half men, a girl with cold hands. I do moo not, nor cow to fear were her words. Let me wash your occasional dirty hands, I countered. You cannot harm a fly, she replied, and threw out her hands. Genuinely average fluff. Yes, that's the point of September. Dice monkey, music man, chia pet, a poetic ally, drawing through to the muse. Now she and the old man don't write at all. To my mind, sweet, I am far above you. Sweetie, dubious, lud ludicrous sweetie, 
but I had a laugh with her. She's like an oversized hat, funny. Canada, Germany, Japan, France, China, health. In-field altruism, chapters increasing, characters race in the background, hairstyle assassination, ethical lunchbox, knee-high antiseptic, zip code gallery, highway honeymoon, seminar schemer, chemical relief, role-playing chatterbox, bare-bones cinematographer, embittered porous beauty. By late afternoon, our eyes were red-rimmed with tears, our ears quite attractive. She smiled and waved in return. This next one is called Afternoon Saints. Pity the ethereal film strip, embryonic anomaly. Let me start again. Pity the ethereal film strip, embryonic anomaly, margarine disruption, some venomous flower, flicker triggered snippet, a destitute ambush, barbed chipmunk seeking alarm, breathtaking curfew, climactic cream saint, quadratic libidinous. Try a cyclone, try a barnacle, new brain trajectory, width, height, hair color, name, a classic battle, a team adventure, a few weeks talent. It's Joey, some pyramid. It's wintertime George, some Freeport upshot, felt like a lithe demon, a manila headache, some truant or afro, buried sexual millionaire wrote and directed infamous queen stunt bike incident, adolescent lazy bones, dick in handcuffs and stacks of raffle tickets, a visa, jo a visa toggling ecstatic, organometallic. Investigators were attempting to determine, among other things, how the gunman entered the building. Diminutive Isaac's son, industrial callus addict, industrial cactus addict, addict, a Darwin, a Danish, maybe a Democrat, embedded in buttermilk, neutered. Tried to elbow the milkman. He's Midwestern, guilty, patrimonial but vigilant, a novice in Loveland. Some county truck rule books, some resultant poison clergyman, impractical Jacqueline, the banshee downstairs, a reptile runt, hesitant starlet, pneumatic Belvedere with dubious toothbrush. Cayuga stewardess tries counterclockwise to locate some transient southward exalted swan, some mouse in a field. Cassandra the resistant sees sails in Eurydice, some seminal attribute in Christopher, chrome convulsions, thiamine deficiency, hardwired salt brush, retrograde conversation. See Lincoln Dapple. See triplet synergism in Parkinson's airfield, a rapt leitmotif, whirl on, freak on. The ascetic sentient did not often fly over the zone, but the path there were two, two spacecrafts. By the path, there were two spacecrafts beached in dazzling clear si skies. The Pleiades, so Freudian, stratospheric and counterproductive were overhead. Madonna said, thanks, Jim, been nice talking to you. You weren't injured, extinguished. The chariot door swung open to a blatant discordant burdock, disposable sandstorm clouds, emblematic of Zurich, not counterpoint, not corrected. Let's see. Here's an a short one, dipped wad in pitcher. Paul sat quietly, a steno pad of his own on his lap. He had finished the last legal pad the previous evening and listened to Annie's voice as she made a statement which consisted of all the things she had told David about Goliath four days ago. Ears attuned to the sound of old Bessie returning. She had only been gone for 45 minutes. He pulled a bunch of Kleenex, dipped the wad in the pitcher, and bent awkwardly over to one side with the soppy mass in his hand. 
The bottom of the mower was smeared with blood, particularly around the grass exhaust, which was still dripping. Um, try and sneak one more in here in my time. My noisy militia, concise Galilee. In the, in the minivan, a pine cone usually competes with a mortician over the support group. Then a skyscraper hides. Any sandwich can accurately sanitize the, an imaginative de deficit, but it takes a real fruitcake to avoid contact with the side. The industrial complex cab driver is ostensibly a big fan of the grain of sand. A hockey player seeks steam engine. Now and then, an asteroid near a paper napkin pees on the boiled warranty. The self-loathing industrial complex, the orbiting inferiority complex, avoid contact with a rattlesnake. When you see a grand piano living with a fire hydrant, it means that somewhere a vapor, vaporized mastodon daydreams. The senator gets stinking drunk and the freight train meditates. Freight train meditates. Inexorably, a paternal parking lot buys an expensive gift for a sandwich. The frustrating bartender trades baseball cards with the carpet tack defined by the spider. Most people believe that a support group can be kind of a graduated cylinder, but they need to remember how slyly is the abstraction. Living with a roller coaster gets most folks stinking drunk. Constituents believe that a chessboard seeks a bartender about a cowboy, but they need to remember how efficiently a particle accelerator takes its leave. A skyscraper finds subtle fault with a food stamp. Indeed, a molten satellite sells the photon inside an eggplant to an insurance agent. A phony avocado pit single-handedly buries the load-bearing wall and a fire hydrant hesitantly graduates from a class action suit to the devil's left hand. That annoying graduated cylinder, a tuba player, a power drill, and the demon are what made America great. When you see the anomaly, it means that the false reactor hesitates. A loyal defendant throws an overwhelmingly treacherous freight train at the avocado pit. The hockey player, defined by a cheese wheel, sells a college-educated blood clot to some strap hanger. Another CEO cracks a warranty and takes a coffee break, and a so-called pickup truck leaves. However, no fundraiser beyond an ocean knows a roller coaster from a blithe spirit. When you see the wheelbarrow, it means that some carpet tack from a salad starts dressing, reminiscent about lost glory. When the proverbial pine cone hibernates, a college-educated graduate, graduated cylinder wakes up. The freight train mortician has a change of heart about his satellite. A wise, obsequious hole puncher knowingly gives lectures on morality to a tomato. Sometimes the college-educated Jersey cow flies into a rage. Most people believe that a greasy cargo bay avoids contact with an avocado pit, but they need to remember that almost every chainsaw ruminates now and again. An umbrella up for warranty is highly paid. A ball bearing, for example, is often related to a dust bunny. A cab driver nonchalantly presents his pink slip to a judge astride a photon. When you see an asteroid, somewhere a hockey player laughs out loud. An unstable nation, speckled, righteous, my noisy militia. Go sandpaper my powder, sadistic metric system, inclement Icelandic skunk, some static sky wave, notorious tinfoil huff, dynamic circumvention, crisscrossing Nagoya, draw, smash, cremate, moist dining room, steeplechase arc, the Shirley jangle, leather tassel, fixate, not cahoot, sidetrack the hammer throw, luminous skating, a wealth of words, heap, Thanks a lot. Sorry, I went a little bit long. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> that was great. Um, thank you, Lee. Um, so the next reader is Wendy Shu. Uh, poet, editor, and professor Wendy Shu 
is the author of The Past, Wesleyan University Press in 2021, and Phrasis, which came out from Fence Books, uh, named one of the 10 best poetry books of 2017 by the New York Times Book Review. Her work has appeared in The Best American Poetry, Granta, Poetry, Ten House, The New Republic, and widely elsewhere. She is assistant professor of writing at the New School in New York City, where she teaches poetry. And I just want to say that um, there's a really good reading that um, a wonderful reading she did on the, and, on the poetry at the Poetry Project a couple months ago. And she read a lot from the past and it's been sort of a, a soundtrack in my head. It's just so razor sharp uh, and, and dreamy at the same time. And also just this connection to family that I think in this disconnection we've all felt, it's, it's spoken to me so much. And, and I find this, uh, the past so uh, deeply moving. Um, please welcome Wendy Shu. Thank you so much, Todd. Um, and thank you for bringing us together. Um, I, I think this is such a cool constellation of people and Wendy and Lee, I just enjoyed those readings so much. I kind of wanted you both to just keep reading. <clears throat> um, and yeah, I'm just excited to be here. I, I appreciate everybody making time to, I mean, listen to poetry on an afternoon is um, really fun. Um, so I'm going to read from the past. Um, and I've been saying recently that, you know, it, the, the past is for me, maybe both the most interesting and kind of essential thing that I like to think about in poems and simultaneously just literally the most boring thing you could choose to think about. You know, it's like gigantic and amorphous and, and sometimes I think um, kind of overwhelms me. Um, so uh, some of that spirit is maybe here in the book. Um, what I'm gonna do is um, the past has three sections um, and I'll read a little bit from each section. Um, and the first section is titled Pledge, which I've been saying is, you know, um, pledge in, in many, many senses, um, pledges in uh, the Pledge of Allegiance, pledges in the naturalization pledge that they make you take when you become a U.S. citizen, um, both pledges um, that happen to me and my family and both like very weird kind of violent sorts of pledges. Um, so these are, these are from Pledge, um, and I'll start with a poem um, called Looking at My Father, about watching my <laughs> father struggle to do yard work. Looking at my father. It's the inside which comes out as I contemplate him there half in sunlight, weeding diligently a Midwestern lawn. On my persons, I have only notes and a drying pen, the memory of onion blossoms scenting in a window. Reflection is my native medium. I am never arriving, only speaking briefly on material conditions between myself and others. My country inoculates me lovingly over time. My country grasps me like desire. I will show you my credentials, which is to say my vivid description if you ask. Here we are, my father and I, never hostile, a small offering. Pointless cut flowers appear on the kitchen table when one finally arrives into disposable income still possible. Am I living? Do I accept revision as my Godhead and Savior? I do and I am. And in the name of my Chinese father now dragging the tools back inside, brow shining but always a grin, faithless except to protect whatever I still have time to become. Amen. Names of the River. I did wrong by all ideas of nation, haunted by the afterlife of speech, 
public acts wagging their dutiful tails. I sat down in the crosswinds of a feeling too wild to write it out how the Velcro parts of me unstuck themselves. But do you too, alone, ever feel incompetent? If in one hand holding a wet tissue for dignity when the youngs of you leaves you cold. Somewhere in America, a white boss in a dandelion dress shirt is raising his voice again. A quick pivot to the page where I stare down the verbs and am afraid to make a recitation of myself. Am I unimitable or is this just another feeling? By all accounts, the river was yellowed over time, a yoke running over land, and yet in places, pearly foam, like clouds, like the overlook I might have photographed, sinewy green and the snow pricked thumb of that mountain, I've forgotten its name, under which nobody I still remember to call was born. In the days when they came and tried to take my mother away in a van to the county hospital for procedures against her will for the good of the population growing too fast because of dumb, ugly country folk like her. Had the day not been hot and mean a government calling me home by a different word. I would have made a record of everything there flowing from the mouth of the river, the yellow and deep water, the big mouth, the five stars, the Tao. One reminding me now of the next, heavier than foreign air, their yellow names soaking the page. Um, so I'm going to jump to the title section of the book called The Past, um, which contains some elegies and some, some other things. Um, it starts with a poem called List of Forgivenesses. List of Forgivenesses. The children I was, the chemical bitten green of their sadness, who watched the generational assembly of prior knowledge, whose shame formed somewhere over the neon ocean. Sorrow is ever inelegant, the squat concrete faces that greeted them, not knowing where to pass the salt at endless Christian tables, whose hand to hold, whose tongue, yearlings stalk the wilted margins of America, light through trembling fingers of foreign trees, who once cut their hair tight black and straight across the forehead, whose blood was dark as soy, vinegared cabbage, radish root, the hours adrift in someone's blue eye, the humble light that carried them there, the tragedies I thought I was, the slow burn of moonlight each night up there patiently unbelieving even in itself. Poem about my life. The opening to another country was always inside my father's mind in many forms in dreams, green swords swirling in a winter mist, colorful moths, sometimes a molar falling out, porcelain clattering onto the table like a single rung chime. When I come into the house, I am held by him, become a child again. The view from here seems never to change, but in wishing it over many years, I have changed it. A new worry 
is my father's more delicate footsteps picking out a path to the bathroom sink at night. The hair beneath the gardening hat leaking its color. When the writing will not come, then I must go to the porch and listen there to the talking of one tree to its double and think of my father who used to say that living is not so painful as living would have you believe. When as a teenager, I borrowed the rusted Nissan, drove it through a field and returned it to him with sudden blue flowers tucked into its mouth. The bluest one he saved, the wind that made those dull trees sing, blowing in from the future somewhere my father has never been. Um, I always wish that, don't you all wish you could go back in time and then you accidentally uh, borrow your parents' car and drive it through a field that you're not supposed to. You could just say, dad, hang on, in, year, in a couple of decades, uh, I'll just use this to make art. So chill out, what are you? <laughs> What are you so upset about, if only? Um, the last poem I'll read from this section um, is called Why Write? Um, I think it's a, a question that I was asking myself a lot um, while writing this book. And maybe that many of us who make art or who write have been asking during these last two years. You know, I know I have, I feel like I wake up with this question on my mind. Um, and then the answer changes depending on the day. Um, it also references a really excellent um, movie with David Hemmings in it. Why write? Uncle visits me in the film where the artist encounters a dead man in the park, unconvincingly half hidden in the bushes. And the chance to photograph death is so electric and brief that the artist runs away, forgetting the camera and the dark hum of the trees at night runs to find a buyer for the photograph he has already forgotten to take. Uncle belongs to the airlessness of memory, soft and black and quiet, while I hold to the white of the page, its paling folds, a skiff charging the future, cargoless and tired, were it any other color. Uncle doesn't take sides now that he is dead, or he is forever on the side of the dead who collect their prize every time I am writing to reach the winning side. Uncle expels doubt from the sentence, threatening to double back on itself, its anger at carrying forth in a mute direction, its grief over where it began. Uncle begins again, while I pluck a memory at random, tender as it is, clear onion stew, from which uncle ladles up a single unlidded goat's eye, laughs and begins to see us with it. The squealing of children for more, the living oblige. I am not writing to photograph the past, I am writing to sit inside the pauses of uncle's sentences, the commas of the dead, the stormless harbor where uncle rests his head. Thank you all for listening. Um, I'm just gonna end with reading um, one little sonnet from this <clears throat> little section of um, sonnets that I called Tiananmen Square sonnets. Um, these are sonnets um, made to evade algorithmic censorship um, of the numbers 6, 4, and 89 in reference to um, Tiananmen Square 1989. Um, so these are conceptually sonnets that could escape this kind of um, numerical censorship and, and surveillance. Um, Tiananmen Sonnet. Thank you again for listening.
dead air in air. The anniversary of language holds you back against bucolic dreaming. Downstream from here is running a miraculous color. Elegy bursts like a ribbon in air. Thinking again of the square today, bold sky, passing episodes of cloud. Vegetation mutters in the far west. A column of ghosts going violet over time. Familiar song looping overhead. Lines pressed in air. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so, so uh, deeply and sincerely, uh, Wendy, Lee, and Wendy for those gorgeous readings. Um, thank you for, for being with us today and sharing your poetry. Um, it is now my honor to introduce today's curator. Uh, Brooklyn-based poet and artist Todd Colby is the author of six books of poetry. His most recent book, Splash State, was published by The Song Cave in 2014. And his writing and art have appeared, uh, have recently appeared in The Believer, Bomb Magazine, here at the Brooklyn Rail, Denver Quarterly, Dizzy Magazine, Hyperallergic, and Poetry Magazine. Uh, Todd, it has been such a joy to put on today's event with you. And without further ado, passing the mic over to you. Thank you. I, I um, listening to all of you read, I, I just feel so grateful, um, especially in a time of such turmoil, just sitting here and listening to these beautiful words and expressions. Uh, it, 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 it gives, it, I feel enormous gratitude right now. I'm very emotional. Um, okay, here's the poems. People will still love. A certain sense of civility matched the day perfectly. I was most funny when I wasn't trying to be. Sometimes I think I'm dying and I am. 143 likes. Deep inside the sold out day, people are trying to find satisfaction and maintain their wonder. In many cases, I don't know anything. And meanwhile, a heat dome is the beginning of the end of something good. The air conditioner sounds like a vinyl version of metal machine music. Caving in is better than being above reproach. The darkest, saddest, hottest summer is halfway over. The sun dips behind the high line at a new angle. More coffee never solved anything. The corpse flower blooms once every nine years. Free sunlight free water, fresh orange paint on the side of that monstrous building. Brilliant juice. It is the people who remember, but when the people are gone, we won't have anyone to remember. People go to a lot of trouble to make things memorable. I would like to make things enjoyable by watching everyone and wondering what is going on. Today, I am as full of this day as the air in this apartment is full of particulate matter that sparkles off the highway. A sliver of the moon is still visible at midday. Reading the news is unbearable, but necessary. All exits are final and all that. This is a test. You might have forgotten something. Perhaps you forgot something. Life makes things impossible. Everything is unbearable. It is good when things fail. Everything is working. The day is bright and brooding. The day is angular and sharp. The day is a shit show. It is harsh and irregular. There must be something beautiful here. People flip birds at you. People ask you to deliver things to their homes and then they flip birds at you. Birds flutter from their hands. You follow the rules governing chaos. You adhere to the rules governing civil behavior. People follow rules all the time, but it doesn't matter. Someone has to follow the rules, but it doesn't matter. I can see everything clearly now. Everything is clear. What I see is everything here, and it's clear. My fingers are shriveled from soaking in the light. 
My fingers are shriveled. My fingers are soaking in the light. Can you see where I'm waiting for you in a room? I'm waiting for you in a room. I assume you understand where I am. Our delight. Much was said to us to our delight. A cause for delight was spilled out. Look, much to our delight, whatever it takes to their delight. Was it delight? Look at this JPEG of a kitten on your phone. There are diminishing prospects for a fruitful life. Yes, it was a pretty big delight. Yes, there is so much delight. Our delight? A lot of delight was had by all. I think he was the kind of person who made everyone go, yes, that was a delight, much to our delight. Gritted off for transfer to a place of delight. Are you too blue to be delighted? I'm giving it everything to keep you in my thoughts. America is waiting for something delightful. Strong feelings with a freedom from lack of delight. She had a golden retriever named Delight. He talked with delight under an electric light while listening to the traffic in Iowa. Read the news like an anchor, but with delight. Paint in a world of cracked screens, but don't let delight get the best of you. 113. If I were writing copy for a sleep app, is there anything you'd like me to include? a trident gum stick, a dollop of peanut butter, a bran muffin, and superstition in every room. Any chance we could chat about positive and negative space? In particular, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the use of silver and orange on pants. It is the desire to be whole that pollutes the time-space wing we're in now. Not that I'm counting, but do you have a slight case of sadism? Older versions of my friends appear all the time, a sunset, the same color as ghee butter. I was my, it was my turn to do lake patrol, so I guided myself by the moon. Little did I know I'd become a vandal with these thick corporate sets. Once you lose a connection to power, people stop wanting to destroy you with things. A wordless gesture like giving finger or shaving a star into the crown of your head. The system of being alive means you're in a system. Thrust through the universe. And then curtains. Lucite sunrise while thinking about Lucretius. People are weirdos. Start something new on an old office chair. Country caffeine. There is joy and despair in being alive. My in-depth study of what happens when we die came up with nothing. Zilch, nada. A painting isn't one thing or another. Casting about for an off-ramp, Friday warm to middling as cement truck idles out front, ambient color fields. And then I listen to the glisten of all the things that never happened the most. I'm like, what is it? Repurposed decay. The fairness question is complicated, just like love and, and understanding what I intend to do and what happens next. God, tiger, needs chemical works. The pair are pictured sitting down having some chill time with wine. This is the end of all beginnings. Let me get them for you. They are, you know, dangerously longing, a large boulder the size of a small boulder. A sea snail made its way into my knee overnight. All it takes is a glimpse backed with light to know they are here with us now. And um, I'm just gonna read two more poems. And this one is called Nothing is delayed. Raise your hand if you have ESP. Start with yellow as a source of light. I have a little crush on your bullshit. The slow sparks of a quiet Saturday fueled by protein bars and caution tape. The rose stencil, joggers. If this hadn't happened, this wouldn't have happened. 
And so a day uncoils and the spring vessel goes haywire and sun, humming a melody as we walk home so slowly that people ask us if we need help. Tell me what goes on in cramped submarines. Draw the curtains and stop aching so. Thanks for not toning it down. And this is my final poem and it's called Post Title. People are so awkward. They're banging into everything. Part of the reason the day plagues us is because ambulances made a lot of sound when they pick injured people up. I would like to embrace people who are determined to stick with it when things get weird with a crisis. Lucky people respond to fractals. I do not really want this great cover to end, nor the tissue aspect of my body or the internet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Todd. Um, thank you for that beautiful reading. Thank you for gathering all of these wonderful poets together today. Um, so thank you, Todd, Wendy, Lee, and Wendy. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and um, enjoying poetry on a Wednesday here in January. Uh, we encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on our YouTube channel, where we will upload today's conversation shortly. Join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for Smart Contracts Aren't and Other Legal Issues in Blockchain and Art with lawyers Erica R. Neerum and Sarah C. Odenkirk in conversation with Rail Editor-at-Large Charlotte Kent. We conclude with a, a poetry reading by Matea Harvey. Uh, you can now all turn on your microphones to say hello and goodbye, and um, happy Wednesday, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. L-O-B-E-U, Todd. L-O-B-E-U, Lee. L-O-B-E-U, Wendy. L-O-B-E-U, everybody. It was wonderful to see you. Excellent. Thank you, Lee. L-O-L, Amazing curation. Grazie mille, Todd. Thank you. Amazing. Amazing curation. Love the reading. Indeed, our day is now filled with optimism <laughs> and, uh, and sensitivity, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> and and puppies. Happy, oh, yeah. happy 2022, you guys. Yeah, happy new year, everyone. Happy thank new year, so everybody. Much. Happy new year. Bye. Bye. Thank, you, thank, you, thank, you. thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and see you all soon, very, very soon. Bye. Hope so. Take care. Ciao, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.